so good morning uh, this is our fifth lecture session of the course fluid mechanics so yesterday we were talking about the no slip boundary condition so let's uh, quickly uh, review it once again so what i mentioned is that in case of uh, a no slip condition is that if i have some solid surface and say flow is happening over the solid surface then we will be finding finding at microscopic level we will be having some surface irregularity is present okay and in between these surface irregularities we will be having actually entrapment of the molecules of the fluid so because of this we will be finding that whatever the immediate adjacent layer to this solid surface is there that will be acquiring the velocity equal to that of the solid okay so and now you can see when i am talking about this velocity of the fluid this is nothing but i am considering the tangential direction so that is the reason for no slip condition i mentioned that v tangential will be nothing but equal to velocity of solid okay so this is something which is called as no slip condition on contrary if my surface is a solid surface for example the this table which is made up of a wood so this wood over here is actually having very less porosity so it's kind of impermeable to the fluid so if i pour water on this then that water cannot penetrate through it okay on contrary even if in its surrounding air is there but air molecule cannot penetrate through it okay so if we are having some solid which do not allow fluid to pass through it then we can say that the normal component of the velocity through that solid surface will also be zero okay so if i am saying that normal component is zero the meaning is that our boundary is actually impermeable okay so our boundary is impermeable now uh, this is for the case of a solid but uh, uh, it 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 does not applicable for solid it is applicable even for other type of surfaces as well so other surface how i can say i can say that say i have a stationary liquid okay so say i have a big lake or pond in which i have a free surface of liquid and over this free surface of liquid if i say uh, air is flowing okay so here also in this situation also because this liquid free surface is stationary so i can consider that velocity of the fluid will be zero velocity of this air layer will be zero at this fluid surface okay however if you give like significant more amount of velocity then of course there can be there can be uh, some disturbances at the free surface but considering that if free surface is remaining undisturbed Okay, and it is stationary. Then this air layer will also occupy some. So velocity vector will be something like this. So at this location, once again, the tangential velocity of the air will be zero, which is nothing but the velocity of this free surface of the liquid. Okay. So anything can be adjacent to a fluid, to a moving fluid. So whatever it is, if it is a free surface, another fluid. surface or if it is a uh, if it is a solid surface it will acquire that particular velocity in tangential direction on contrary in normal direction if the property of that surface is such that it does not allow the material to penetrate through it then it will be called as impermeable boundary and the normal velocity will be zero on contrary if you are having say uh, in place of this table if you consider a piece of sponge Okay, so sponge is having lot of porosity. So if you pour water of over that, then that water can enter through the sponge and come through other side. Okay, so in that case, if we see tangential velocity can be zero because of the no slip condition, but water can penetrate in vertical direction. So as water can penetrate in vertical direction, so there will be certain normal component of the velocity. Okay, so uh, this is typically this is typically a uh, very strong uh, uh, condition which prevails in all natural as well as the engineering applications so typically if you find a solid surface and say initially flow of air was happening at some velocity say v infinity 
which I am calling as free swim velocity. So all air layer were layers were moving at the same velocity. But when these air layers will come in contact with the solid surface, so what will be happening? The layer which is in immediate contact with the surface, its velocity will become zero. Okay. Layer which is very far away from the surface. That will be having velocity equal to V infinity. Okay. So all the layers which are very far away from the surface, these will be having velocity is equal to V infinity only, free stream velocity. Okay. But what will be happening as close to the surface, we are having a zero velocity. So because of a property of the fluid which provides resistance to its flow, to its motion. What this particular layer will do, it will try to slow down the next layer. So the next layer will not have velocity equal to V infinity, but it will have some less velocity than V infinity. So same will keep on propagating till the velocity is becoming close to the free stream velocity. Okay, And we will get this type of velocity profile. Okay. So you can see in this particular velocity profile, we have some reason of the flow, particularly if I uh, draw it something like this. So below this point, I can say that I have the existence of strong changes in velocity with the y direction. So it means I have strong gradients of the velocity in this particular region, okay, along the y direction. So this particular reason is something which is called as the viscous flow. Okay, so this particular reason over here is something which is called as the viscous flow. And the reason outside this where velocity is equal to V infinity and there is no gradient of the velocity with space, that particular flow is called as inviscid flow. So it means that what this no slip condition is doing, no slip condition is actually slowing down the immediate moving layer, but once it has slowed it down, then comes in the viscosity of the fluid, which actually stops its neighboring layers. Not completely stops, but provides some resistance to the flow of the neighboring layers. And that keep on propagating and we see that the in between two layers, there will be actually slight increase in velocity and ultimately when velocity has reached equal to that of the free stream velocity, then of course it cannot move faster than the free stream velocity. So all the layers will occupy the same free stream velocity. Okay. So, yes. Yes. In that case, if there is no slip condition, then of course, at that solid surface also there will be some velocity. But how much velocity? So of course it cannot be exactly equal to V infinity. Solid surface will of course offer certain amount of resistance. But this velocity then will be slightly less than the velocity. So it may happen that despite of starting from zero, your velocity profile, if this is the solid surface, your velocity profile may start something like this. Okay, this also happens. Where this happens, this happens in slip flow condition. So when our Nansen number is from 0 0.01 to 0 0.1, in that particular resign, this type of condition happens where no slip is not uh, perfectly applicable. Okay, so that is the situation in case of our micro channel flows. If we are having a micro channel having dimension of less than 1 micrometer or so, in these scenarios, our Nansen number goes into that design and design. Okay. So, what I am trying to say over here is that the reason of the flow, where gradient of velocity is existing, that particular reason we are calling as viscous flow and the reason outside uh, that reason, where no gradients of uh, velocity are existing, that particular reason we are calling as in. Okay, so this is one major classification we will be using. Now, this is uh, the reason 
you can see many natural occurrences as well as in uh, many many other uh, 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 engineering applications as well so if you see the say uh, burj khalifa how much long length it is uh, height it is that okay so if you see when they are moving towards the apex of that building they are concentrating it to a narrow thing why we know that close to the surface of the ground we will be having viscous effects dominant so if any wind flow is happening their velocity will be low when this will keep on increasing as we move away from the surface velocity will keep on increasing so you can see in terms of wind velocity also okay so when winds are there close to the ground you will not feel much disruption okay but away as you are keeping on increasing the height then you will be having a feel more strong then typically if you are passing through a say uh, water body okay flowing water stream though it is not recommended to pass through a flowing water stream but even if say someone is passing through that then what is advised it is advised that when we are taking the steps we should not raise our foot to high we should keep it close to the surface because close to the surface the velocity of the flowing water layers will be low okay so because of that we will feel less force on contrary if we if we raise our feet then we will be feeling the faster velocity of the force okay so there are many things associated with this effect viscous effect is actually very very important uh, because typically all our vehicles Cars, buses, aircrafts. These require certain amount of certain amount of power in order to propel them. Okay, so significant portion of that power goes into overcoming the drag force. What is drag force? Now, this gradient of velocity. We will study in in details. This gradient of velocity will create some wall shear stress over here, and that wall shear stress will apply certain resistive force on the solid surface as well. If solid is moving in the forward direction. Okay. So whatever the resistance force applied by the flow of air, that is something which we are calling as uh, drag force. Okay. So significant amount of engine's power. of either aircraft engine or uh, uh, we are calling this uh, car engine bus engine that goes in actually over the drag force okay is this point clear okay so now uh, we have talked uh, about the no slip and no penetration condition so now let's talk about the important property on which we started discussion yesterday but we couldn't complete it so that is this possible okay so if we talk about the viscosity uh, as i told you yesterday that viscosity is nothing but on a broader sense we can say that it is the quantitative measure of the internal resistance offered by the fluid to the fluid okay so that is something which is viscosity okay so now to study the concept of viscosity let us consider that we are having two plates one is this solid plate and another is this solid plate and this solid plate is fixed so it means velocity of this solid is equal to zero and let us consider that this solid plate is subjected to some tangential force df because of which it is moving at say constant velocity du so whenever you will be su uh, subjecting a stationary plate to some force before reaching to the constant velocity it will go through some transient period also okay but over here we are considering when it has reached the steady phase is this one clear yeah. so if you apply a force on this object then of course initially it will accelerate from zero velocity to the velocity up to which it can accelerate and then it will move with the constant velocity okay so it has some initial transient period also 
So over here, we are not considering that initial transient phase. We are just considering that uh, once we applied the force, after that, whatever the constant velocity this plate has acquired, we have reached to that state. Okay. Now let us consider that from here, flow of fluid was actually coming through between these two plates. Okay. And we are considering in third dimension, which is normal to this board. In third dimension, say the width of the plate is actually infinite. So, in third dimension, width of the plate is infinite. So, in third direction, plate is very, very long. So, now if I consider this type of situation, now what will be happening? Say, when uh, this started moving, at that time, our fluid volume was having this shape. So this was our say any fluid volume. So if I consider this fluid volume, what will be happening? Say this was at some time T0. Okay. So this bottom most portion of the fluid volume will take the position, uh, will take uh, velocity equal to that of 0 and topmost layer will take velocity equal to that of du. Okay. So say after some time T which is nothing but T naught plus dt. So after some infinitesimally small time, if I see the fluid volume, it will be something like this. Okay, Because this front end as well as the back end at the top both are moving at the same velocity. So this angle and this angle both will be is this one clear? Now, let us consider that the angle which it has traversed, say it is d theta. Okay? d theta is the angle and say the spacing between the plates is dy. So, infinitesimally small spacing is there between these plates. So, spacing between the plates is dy okay so spacing is dy and uh, angle is d theta now what will be happening it has traveled some horizontal distance can you tell me how much will be this horizontal distance du is the velocity and time period which we have considered is dt so, this horizontal distance will be nothing but du into dt. Okay? Now, if you see this d theta, we can assume this as nothing but a triangle. So, over here I can write tan d theta is equal to du dt by dy. Okay. Now, if I have considered infinitesimally small time dt, my time is very small, then the angle which it has moved that will be also very small and we can say that for small angles tan d, d theta is nearly equal to d. Okay. So, I can say from here that my d theta is equal to du by dy into dt. Up to this point is it clear? Now, we have seen that, we have seen that from a fundamental law which is nothing but uh, Newton's law of fluid motion, what it tells, it tells that because of this, of course, this shear force is acting on some uh, this fluid area. Okay. So, what will be happening? If I simply draw the free body diagram of fluid, then force is applied on a solid surface, but on this fluid layer, there will be some resistive force acting which is of equal magnitude. Okay. So, it means force is acting on this fluid element also, same amount of force df and if say dA is this area, 
then I will be having one shear stress over here, which is nothing but equal to df by d. So that is the shear stress which is acting over here. Now, from the fundamental definition of the fluid flow, we know that from the fundamental definition of fluid flow, we know that that shear stress in a fluid medium is directly proportional to rate of shear scale. Okay, so tau is directly proportional to d theta is my constant deformation but this deformation has taken place in time dt okay so what will be the rate of deformation over here or rate of shear strain so rate of deformation will be nothing but d theta by d is this one clear so from the fundamental definition of the fluid we know that tau which is actually the shear stress that is proportional to the rate of shear strain. So d theta is our deformation in time period dt. So d theta by dt over here is nothing but our rate of shear strain. Okay. So that is the reason tau will be directly proportional to d theta by dt. Now, from this previous equation, I can say that d theta by dt is nothing but du by dy. So ultimately, my tau has become directly proportional to du by dy. What is du by dy over here? If you see du by dy is nothing but our velocity gradient. So what we are saying that the bottom plate, bottom plate is stationary. So it is fluid layer close to bottom layer is having zero velocity. Top plate is moving with velocity du. So top layer is having velocity du. So when we are moving from bottom plate to top plate, the different fluid layers are having different different velocities which are varying from zero to du. So it means in y direction, in dy direction, there is existence of a velocity. Okay. So we can show over here that for this given flow situation, our tau is nothing but directly proportional to the right? Is this part clear? Now, uh, so fundamental definition of Newton's law is tau is directly proportional to d theta by dt. But for this given situation, d theta by dt is becoming equal to d by d dy. So that is the reason we are calling uh, that tau is directly proportional to velocity gradient. Otherwise, fundamentally, we will be saying that it is directly proportional to rate of shear strain. Okay. Now, here comes. So up to this point, there is no issue. But now we have to remove this uh, proportionality. Okay. So to remove this proportionality and bring it equality over here, here comes one very very important constant. So we write over here tau equal to mu times du by dy. So this entire is nothing but Newton's law of Newton's law of and this particular parameter which we have considered over here mu it is called as dynamic viscosity so mu over here is nothing but dynamic viscosity. okay this is one important property of the fluid medium so this is the property of the fluid medium which will be only manifested when there is a flow in the fluid. Okay, because so what is the origin of this? The origin of this is we have got in Newton's law we have got one proportionality, and in that proportionality we are having both the things: shear stress as well as the velocity gradient, and then this constant is coming into the picture. Okay, so it means that. This dynamic viscosity is applicable only for a flowing fluid. So if you have hydrostatic situation, 
Okay, if you have hydrostatic situation where shear stress is equal to zero, there is no relative motion between the fluid layers. All the fluid layers are at rest. So corresponding to that, we are not having any existence of the gradient. So it means viscosity of the fluid don't have any meaning when fluid is at rest. Okay, viscosity, the effect of viscosity will be only manifested when the fluid is in flow. Is this point clear? So, uh, if you see dimensionally, dimensionally you can see uh, the units of this. So, tau is having units identical to that of uh, pressure, force per unit area. So, unit of viscosity will be say Pascal and once again I have written it wrongly, it should be du by du. Okay. So, here this is meter per second and this meter is cancelling out. So, here I am having unit of per second. So, this per second will multiply over here. So, my unit is becoming Pascal second. So, in SI system I can say that unit of dynamic viscosity is nothing but Pascal second. Okay. Now, typically, uh, typically this Pascal second or I can say the more popular unit of viscosity is something which is called as poise. Okay. And one poise is equal to 0.1 Pascal second. Okay, so more popular unit of viscosity is poise and one poise is nothing but equal to 0.1 Pascal second. Okay, and uh, I can also write uh, another unit, centipoise. Centipoise is actually more popular because viscosity of water at 20 degrees Celsius temperature is nothing but equal to 0.1. How much? That is the reason it is almost unit. So that is the reason that uh, poise and centipoise are more popular uh, values of viscosity because what we will be doing, uh, what we will be doing when we present. So water is a very common fluid, and uh, when we present the viscosity of all other fluids, then we take say relative to water, we kind of consider water as a Okay. Is this one clear? Now comes one important idea. So, viscosity is something uh, which is a property which is actually balancing the shear stress and rate of shear stress. Okay. Now comes one important point. What is the effect of fluid? Is there any effect of fluid on viscosity? Like if we change the fluid, then viscosity changes or not. Okay, so the point is yes, it changes. For example, you can clearly observe air is having low viscosity in comparison to water. On contrary, if you take some thick oil that is having even more viscosity than water. Okay, so how its manifestation comes uh, in terms of the stress strain behavior that you can see over here. So, say this is my stress, shear stress tau and this is my rate of shear strain or I can call it as even velocity gradient into by over. Okay. So, if I apply this for a low viscous fluid, then for a low viscous fluid like air, I will be finding my line will be something like this. And slope of this line over here will give me nothing but viscosity. Okay. Slope is nothing but tau divided by du by dy. So, that will give me viscosity. So, this is for air. What will happen to water? Can you tell me what will happen to water? So, 
to say this is for water. Okay. If I have any other more viscous fluid, say oil, which is more viscous than water, then my line will be something like this and this is say some oil. One important observation is here, as the dynamic viscosity is increasing, our fluid can offer more resistance to the flow. How? For same amount of, for same amount of velocity gradient, you have to apply more amount of tendency Okay. Is this one clear? However, for all the fluids, you can see the graph is starting from zero only. So the meaning is, if you even apply infinite amount of, infinitely small amount of shear stress, then also there will be deformation. But how much deformation will be there? That will be governed by the properties. Okay, because it all these graphs has to pass through the origin, because then only it will satisfy the fundamental definition of the fluid, which is that even if we give the infinitely small amount of uh, shear stress, then also there will be deformation. Okay. So deformation is there in all three cases, but amount of deformation or rate of deformation is something which is controlled by the viscosity. So when viscosity is increasing, then for getting same amount of deformation, we have to apply more amount of is this one clear? Now, the fluids which follows this straight line behavior in between shear stress and shear strain, a rate of shear strain, these fluids, for these fluids, this slope will be always constant. Okay. So, these fluids will always have constant viscosity. Such type of fluids are called as Newtonian fluids. The fluid which follows Newton's law of viscosity means for which the value of viscosity is constant. Okay. Such type of fluids are called as nothing but the Newtonian fluids. Up to this point is it clear? This is very very important definition. And this is directly connected to this graph. So when this graph is violated, then our fluid will not be normal means if we are not having a straight line behavior, our viscosity is not constant with the shear rate, it is changing with the shear rate, then a fluid will not be. Okay. Now, let us try to see, like we have seen that all our other properties of the fluid are nothing but the function of temperature and pressure. So, what happens to viscosity when it comes uh, when there are changes in the temperature and pressure of the fluid. Okay. So typically uh, on an engineering level if we see the changes in viscosity of the fluid medium with pressure are almost okay. On contrary, uh, it is significantly affected by the changes in temperature for both liquid as well as for gases. For liquids viscosity decreases when the temperature is increased and for gases, viscosity increases when the temperature is increased. Why so? Can any one of you answer? So typically if we see the liquids, their molecules are more closer to each other. Okay. So molecules are having strong cohesive forces, strong attractive forces to each other. Okay. So these cohesive forces are nothing but responsible for offering the internal resistance to the flow. On contrary, in case of gases, there are the cohesive forces are not strong, but there are molecular collisions. One molecule is going from here then colliding with the other molecules. So these molecular collisions are nothing but responsible for offering the resistance to the flow. For example, if a molecule is moving from left to right, suddenly a molecule will come from the bottom randomly and that will hit this molecule. 
Once it is hitting this molecule, it will affect its velocity towards the right eye. So it means the molecular collision, so more are the molecular collisions, more will be the resistance to move in a particular flow direction. Okay. So that is the reason that uh, when we increase the temperature, when we increase the temperature, what happens? The molecular spacing in case of liquids becomes larger. So when molecular spacing is becoming larger, their coercive forces will become weak. Okay, so that is the reason for liquids uh, viscosity decreases with increasing temperature. On contrary, if you increase the temperature of the gases, then what will be happen? Then their yes, their intermolecular interactions will increase. Collisions, number of collisions, etc., will increase. They will provide more resistance to the Okay, so typically uh, speaking, if we plot the variation of uh, viscosity uh, with temperature, then typically uh, for a liquid we see that its decrease is kind of uh, exponential and for gases we can see that almost it uh, increases in a uh, power of Hessian. So this is for liquids this is for gases now as per this uh, uh, as per kinetic theory of gases for gases uh, viscosity is uh, directly proportional to square root of temperature okay however this law is uh, uh, more refined so uh, by Sutherland and he has mentioned that viscosity of the gases can be represented as uh, A times square root of T divided by 1 plus B by T. We have A and B are some constants and these constants can be fitted depending, depending upon the range of temperature we are using for different types of things. Okay. So, these constants can be fitted and whatever the experimentally measured values of viscosity are there, these values of viscosity can be met. Okay. Then comes viscosity of liquids. So viscosity of liquids uh, typically it from the graph it appears that it is decaying almost in an exponential fashion but uh, more accurate relation which closely predicts uh, the viscosity of liquids with the variation in temperature is given something like this uh, a into 10 raised to power b divided by t minus c so here all these a b c are nothing but the constants and for different different liquids in certain given range of temperature these constants are fitted from the data and these constants are here. okay so how you can determine the values of these constants so you can for a given flu say you want to measure viscosity from 20 degrees celsius to 500 degrees celsius so what you can do for a given flu so in this equation only there are two constants so you can measure the viscosity at two points and then you can apply this equation to find out the constant theorem. on contrary for liquids you have to measure the viscosity first at three different temperature conditions and then you can substitute back into this equation to find out the first Okay, so in your textbook you can refer these uh, values of these constants are given for standard fluids like air and temperature, uh, air and water within the some specified Okay, so that you can check from there. Up to this point is it clear? Now, we have seen the variation of viscosity with temperature okay and this is particularly the case where we are having constant viscosity fluids which are called as newtonian fluids okay uh, there are other types of fluids also which does not represent the linear relationship in between shear stress and rate of shear stress these particular fluids are called as non newtonian fluids so fluids where tau equal to mu times du by dy 
if this law is not applicable then we will be calling the fluids as non nuclear is this one clear is this one clear so this non newtonian fluids there are different types of non newtonian fluids so uh let me show over here tau du by d yeah so within 2 3 minutes i will okay so say this is my newtonian fluid which is having constant viscosity then for non newtonian fluids what we have is one special type of fluid we have whose stress strain relationship goes something like this this is called as pseudo plastic fluid then there is one more type of fluid for which stress stress, uh, stress strain relationship goes something like this this is called as dilatant fluid then there is one more type of fluid which initially behaves as solid and once some initial stress is overcome then it behaves like a fluid so that type of fluid is represented by this particular graph and it is called as ideal bingham plastic fluid can you tell me the examples of uh, these types of fluids for newtonian we have seen our water air whatever the common fluids are there glycerin silicon oil all these are nothing but newtonian what are the non newtonian fluids around us so your tomorrow's task is for each of these non newtonian fluid maybe whenever we will be meeting in the next week or next lecture at least for each type of non newtonian fluid you have to find five five examples okay so that is your next task so in the next lecture you will be telling me at least five examples of each of the each type of this non newtonian so now we will stop at this